Hi there, welcome to ISA Kids. This channel is totally for you. So, ready for knowing this amazing chapter force and laws of motion? Let's begin. For many centuries, the problem of motion and its causes had puzzled scientists and philosophers. A ball on the ground, when given a small hit, does not move forever. Such observations suggest that rest is the natural state of an object. This remained the belief until Galileo Galilei and Isaac Newton developed an entirely different approach to understand motion. In our everyday life, we observe that some effort is required to put a stationary object into motion or to stop a moving object. We ordinarily experience this as a muscular effort and say that we must push or hit or pull on an object to change its state of motion, right? The concept of force is based on this pull, push or hit. Thus, objects move because we make a force act on them. Thus, summing it up, force is an external effort which could be in the form of a hit, pull or push and is required to put an object in motion or to stop a moving object. In the previous video, we got to know that a force can be used to change the magnitude of velocity of an object. By magnitude, we mean that it can be used to make the objects move faster or slower. Or, force can also be used to change the direction of motion. We also know that a force can change the shape and size of objects. There are two types of force. Balanced force and unbalanced force. Balanced forces do not change the state of rest or of motion of an object. For example, two strings X and Y are tied to the two opposite faces of a block. If we apply a force by pulling the string X, the block begins to move to the right. Similarly, if we pull the string Y, the block moves to the left. But if the block is pulled from both the sides with equal forces, the block will not move. Such forces do not change the state of rest or of motion of an object and are called balanced forces. A balanced force does not cause any change in motion. It is the result of forces that are equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. Now let us consider a situation in which two opposite forces of different magnitudes pull the block. In this case, the block would begin to move in the direction of the greater force. Thus. The two forces here are not balanced and the unbalanced force acts in the direction the block moves. This suggests that an unbalanced force acting on an object brings it in motion. What happens when some children try to push a box on a rough floor? If they push the box with a small force, the box does not move because of friction acting in a direction opposite to the push. The friction force arises between two surfaces in contact. In this case, between the bottom of the box and the floor's rough surface. It balances the pushing force and therefore the box does not move. If the box is pushed harder, such that the pushing force becomes bigger than the friction force, the box would move. There is an unbalanced force. What happens when we ride a bicycle? When we stop pedaling, the bicycle begins to slow down. 
this is again because of the friction forces acting opposite to the direction of motion in order to keep the bicycle moving we have to start pedaling again it thus appears that an object maintains its motion under the continuous application of an unbalanced force however it is quite incorrect an object moves with a uniform velocity when the forces which is pushing force and friction force acting on the object are balanced and there is no net external force on it if an unbalanced force is applied on the object there will be a change either in its speed or in the direction of its motion thus to accelerate the motion of an object an unbalanced force is required and the change in its speed or the direction of motion would continue as long as this unbalanced force is applied however if this force is removed completely the object would continue to move with the velocity it has acquired till then let's see the first law of motion by observing the motion of objects on an inclined plane galileo deduced that objects move with a constant speed when no force acts on them he observed that when a marble rolls down an inclined plane its velocity increases the marble falls under the unbalanced force of gravity as it rolls down and attains a definite velocity by the time it reaches the bottom its velocity decreases when it climbs up a marble is kept on an ideal frictionless plane inclined on both sides galileo argued that when the marble is released from left it would roll down the slope and go up on the opposite side to the same height from which it was released if the inclinations of the planes on both sides are equal then the marble will climb the same distance that it covered while rolling down if the angle of inclination of the right side plane were gradually decreased then the marble would travel further distances till it reaches the original height if the right side plane were ultimately made horizontal that is the slope is reduced to zero the marble would continue to travel forever trying to reach the same height that it was released from the unbalanced forces on the marble in this case are zero it suggests that an unbalanced or external force is required to change the motion of the marble but no net force is needed to sustain the uniform motion of the marble in practical situations it is difficult to achieve a zero unbalanced force this is because of the presence of frictional force acting opposite to the direction of motion Thus, in practice, the marble stops after traveling some distance. The effect of the frictional force may be minimized by using a smooth marble and a smooth plane and providing a lubricant on top of the planes. Newton further studied Galileo's ideas on force and motion and presented three fundamental laws that govern the motion of objects. These three laws are known as Newton's laws of motion. The first law of motion is stated as an object remains in a state of rest or of uniform motion in a straight line unless compelled to change the state by an applied force. In other words, all objects resist a change in their state of motion. in a qualitative way the tendency of undisturbed objects to stay at rest or even to keep moving with the same velocity is called 
inertia this is why the first law of motion is also known as the law of inertia in case you are liking the video do like share and subscribe to the channel certain experiences that we come across while traveling in a motor car can be explained on the basis of the law of inertia we tend to remain at rest with respect to the seat until the driver applies a braking force to stop the motor car with the application of brakes the car slows down but our body tends to continue in the same state of motion because of its inertia a sudden application of brakes may thus cause injury to us by impact or collision with the panels in the front safety belts are worn to prevent such accidents safety belts exert a force on our body to make the forward motion slower an opposite experience is encountered when we are standing in a bus and the bus begins to move suddenly now we tend to fall backwards this is because the sudden start of the bus brings motion to the bus as well as to our feet in contact with the floor of the bus but the rest of our body opposes this motion because of its inertia when a motor car makes a sharp turn at a high speed we tend to get thrown to one side this can again be explained on the basis of the law of inertia we tend to continue in a straight line motion when an unbalanced force is applied by the engine to change the direction of motion of the motor car we slip to one side of the seat due to the inertia of our body the fact that a body will remain at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force can be illustrated through the following activities make a pile of similar carom coins on a table as shown here attempt a sharp horizontal hit at the bottom of the pile using a striker if the hit is strong enough the bottom coin moves out quickly once the lowest coin is removed the inertia of the other coins makes them fall vertically on the table activity 2 set a 5 rupee coin on a stiff card covering an empty glass tumbler as shown here keep it on a table give the card a sharp horizontal flick with the finger if we do it fast then the card shoots away allowing the coin to fall vertically into the glass tumbler due to its inertia the inertia of the coin tries to maintain its state of rest even when the card flows off activity number 3 place a water filled tumbler on a tray hold the tray and turn around as fast as you can we will observe that the tumbler topples down and water spills why This is because when we turn around fast the tumbler comes into motion but the water continues to remain at rest due to inertia. Observe that a groove is provided in a saucer for placing the tea cup. It prevents the cup from toppling over in case of sudden jerks. Let's get to know the famous scientist Galileo Galilei. He was born on 15 February 1564 in Pisa, Italy. Galileo, right from his childhood, had interest in mathematics and natural philosophy, but his father, Vincenzo Galilei, wanted him to become a medical doctor. Accordingly, Galileo enrolled himself for a medical degree at the University of Pisa in 1581. which he never completed because of his real interest in mathematics in 1586 he wrote his first scientific book the little balance in which he described archimedes method of finding the relative densities of substances using a balance in 1589 in a series of essays 
demo to he presented his theories about falling objects using an inclined plane to slow down the rate of descent in 1592 he was appointed professor of mathematics at the university of padua in the republic of venice here he continued his observations on the theory of motion and through his study of inclined planes and the pendulum he formulated the correct law for uniformly accelerated objects that the distance the object moves is proportional to the square of the time taken galileo was also a remarkable craftsman he developed a series of telescopes whose optical performance was much better than that of the telescopes available during those days around 1640 He designed the first pendulum clock. In his book Starry Messenger on his astronomical discoveries, Galileo claimed to have seen mountains on the moon, the Milky Way made up of tiny stars, and four small bodies orbiting Jupiter. In his book Discourse on Floating Bodies and Letters on the Sunspots, he disclosed his observations of sunspots using his own telescopes and through his observations on saturn and venus galileo argued that all the planets must orbit the sun and not the earth contrary to what was believed at that time in case you are liking the video do like share and subscribe inertia and mass Do all bodies have the same inertia? We know that it is easier to push an empty box than a box full of books. Similarly, if we kick a football, it flies away. But if we kick a stone of the same size with equal force, it hardly moves. A force that is just enough to cause a small cart to pick up a large velocity will produce a negligible change in the motion of a train this is because in comparison to the car the train has a much lesser tendency to change its state of motion accordingly we say that the train has more inertia than the car clearly heavier or more massive objects offer larger inertia quantitatively the inertia of an object is measured by its mass we may thus relate inertia and mass as inertia is the natural tendency of an object to resist a change in its state of motion or at rest the mass of an object is a measure of its inertia hope you are clear till now let's attempt some questions question number 1 In the following example try to identify the number of times the velocity of the ball changes. A football player kicks a football to another player of his team who kicks the football towards the goal. The goalkeeper of the opposite team collects the football and kicks it towards a player of his own team. Also identify the agent supplying the force in each case. The velocity of the football changes four times. First, when a player kicks to another player. Second, when that player kicks the football to the goalkeeper. Third, when the goalkeeper stops the football. And fourth, when the goalkeeper kicks the football towards the player of his own team. agent supplying the force would be first case first player second case second player third case goalkeeper and in the fourth case goalkeeper again question 2 explain why some of the leaves may get detached from a tree if we vigorously shake its branch well The answer of this cause lies behind the Newton's first law of motion. 
initially leaves and tree both are in rest but when the tree is shaken vigorously tree comes in motion while leaves have tendency to be in rest thus because of remaining in the position of rest some of the leaves may get detached from a tree if we vigorously shake its branch next question why do you fall in the forward direction when a moving bus breaks to a stop and why do you fall backwards when it accelerates from rest in a moving bus passengers are in motion along with the bus when brakes are applied to stop a moving bus bus comes in the position of rest but because of tendency to be in the motion a person falls in forward direction similarly when a bus is accelerated from rest the tendency to be in rest a person in the bus falls backwards second law of motion the first law of motion indicates that when an unbalanced external force acts on an object its velocity changes that is the object gets an acceleration we would now like to study how the acceleration of an object depend on the force applied to it and how we measure a force let us recount some observations from our everyday life during the game of table tennis if the ball hits a player it doesn't hurt him much on the other hand when a fast moving cricket ball hits a spectator it may hurt him similarly a truck at rest does not require any attention when parked along a road side but a moving truck even at speeds as low as 5 meters per second may kill a person standing in its path a small mass such as a bullet may kill a person when fired from a gun these observations suggest that the impact produced by the objects depend on their mass and their velocity similarly if an object is to be accelerated we know that a greater force is required to give a greater velocity in other words there appears to exist some quantity of importance that combines the object's mass and its velocity one such property is called momentum it was introduced by newton the momentum p of an object is defined as the product of its mass and velocity that is p is equal to mv momentum has both direction as well as magnitude its direction is the same as that of velocity v the si unit of momentum is kilogram meter per second since the application of an unbalanced force brings a change in the velocity of the object it is therefore clear that a force also produces a change of momentum let us consider a situation in which a car with a dead battery is to be pushed along a straight road to give it a speed of 1 meter per second which is sufficient to start its engine if one or two passengers give a sudden push that is unbalanced force to it it hardly starts but a continuous push over some time results in a gradual acceleration of the car to this speed it means that the change of momentum of the car is not only determined by the magnitude of the force but also by the time during which the force is exerted it may then also be concluded the force necessary to change the momentum of an object depends on the time rate at which the momentum is changed the second law of motion states that the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied unbalanced force in the direction of force mathematical formulation of second law of motion Suppose an object of mass m is moving along a straight line with an initial velocity u. It is uniformly accelerated to velocity v in time t by the application of a constant force f throughout the time t.
the initial and final momentum of the object will be P1 equal to MU and P2 equal to MV respectively. The change in momentum would be P2 minus P1 which is MV minus MU which gives us M times V minus U. The rate of change of momentum would be M times V minus U by T. The applied force would be K times M into V minus U by T which gives us K times M times A. Here A equal to V minus U by T is the acceleration which is the rate of change of velocity. The quantity K is a constant of proportionality. The SI units of mass and acceleration are kilogram and meters per second square respectively. So, unit of force is so chosen that the value of the constant K becomes 1. When the value of K becomes 1, F is equal to MA. For this, one unit of force is defined as the amount of force that produces an acceleration of 1 meters per second squared in an object of 1 kilogram mass. The unit of force is kilogram meters per second square or newton, which has the symbol N. The second law of motion gives us a method to measure the force acting on an object as a product of its mass and acceleration. Do subscribe to the channel, share and like the video please. The second law of motion is often seen in action in our everyday life. For example, have you noticed that while catching a fast moving cricket ball, a fielder in the ground gradually pulls his hands backwards with the moving ball? In doing so, the fielder increases the time during which the high velocity of the moving ball decreases to zero. Thus, the acceleration of the ball is decreased and therefore, the impact of catching the fast moving ball is also reduced. If the ball is stopped suddenly, then its high velocity decreases to zero in a very short interval of time. Thus, the rate of change of momentum of the ball will be large. Therefore, a large force would have to be applied for holding the catch that may hurt the palm of the fielder. In a high jump athletic event, the athletes are made to fall either on a cushioned bed or on a sand bed. This is to increase the time of the athletes fall to stop after making the jump. This decreases the rate of change of momentum and hence the force. Do you wonder how does a karate player break a pile of wood with a single blow? Well, he strikes the pile with his hand very fast. In doing so, the large momentum of his hand is reduced to zero in a very short time. This exerts a large force on the pile of tiles which is sufficient to break them apart. The first law of motion can be mathematically stated from the mathematical expression for the second law of motion. According to the second law of motion, F is M times A or F is M times V minus U by T. FT is MV minus MU, that is, when F is 0, V is 0, for whatever time T is taken. This means that the object will continue moving with uniform velocity U throughout the time T. If U is 0, then V will also be 0, that is, the object will remain at rest. A constant force acts on an object of mass 5 kg for a duration of 2 seconds. It increases the object's velocity from 3 meters per second to 7 meters per second. Let's find the magnitude of the applied force. 
Now, if the force was applied for a duration of 5 seconds, what would be the final velocity of the object? We have been given that u is 3 meters per second, b is 7 meters per second, t is 2 and m is 5. According to the first law of motion, f is m times v minus u by t. Substitution of the values in this relation gives us f equal to 5 kg into 7 minus 3 by 2, that is 10 newtons. Now, if this force is applied for a duration of 5 seconds, then the final velocity can be calculated by f is equal to m times v minus u by t and hence 10 is equal to 5 times v minus 3 by 5. Hence, the final velocity comes out to be 13 meters per second. Which would require greater force, accelerating a 2 kg mass at 5 meters per second square or a 4 kg mass at 2 meters per second square? We know that F is equal to MA. Here, M1 is 2, A1 is 5, M2 is 4 and A2 is 2. Thus, F1 is 10 newtons and F2 is 8 newtons. This means F1 is greater than F2. Thus, accelerating a 2 kg mass at 5 meters per second square would require a greater force. A motor car is moving with a velocity of 108 km per hour and it takes 4 seconds to stop after the brakes are applied. Calculate the force exerted by the brakes on the motor car if its mass along with the passengers is 1000 kg. The initial velocity of the motor car is 30 meters per second and the final velocity is 0 meters per second. The total mass of the motor car along with its passengers is 1000 kg and the time taken to stop it is 4 seconds. We know that the magnitude of the force applied by the brakes is m times v minus u by t. On substituting the values we get 1000 times 0 minus 30 divided by 4 which gives us 7500 newtons. The negative sign tells us that the force exerted by the brakes is opposite to the direction of motion of the motor car. A force of 5 Newton gives a mass m1 and acceleration of 10 meters per second square, a mass m2 and acceleration of 20. What acceleration would it give if both the masses were tied together? We know that F is MA, so M1 is F by A1 and M2 is F by A2. A1 is 10 meters per second square and A2 is 20 meters per second square. Thus, F is, and we know that F is 5 newtons. Thus, if two masses were tied together, the total mass M would be 0.75 kg. The acceleration A produced in the combined mass by a 5 Newton force would be 6.67 meters per second square. The velocity time graph of a ball of mass 20 gram moving along a straight line on a long table is this. How much force does the table exert on the ball to bring it to rest? From the graph, we can see that the initial velocity of the ball is 20 cm per second. Due to the frictional force exerted by the table, the velocity of the ball decreases down to 0 in 10 seconds. V is 0 and T is 10. Since the velocity time graph is a straight line, it is clear that the ball moves with a constant acceleration. The acceleration A is V minus U by T. Therefore, it is 0 minus 20 by 10 which gives us 0 0.02 meters per second square. The force exerted on the ball is M times A which is 0 0.0004 newtons. 
Negative sign implies that the frictional force exerted by the table is in direction opposite to that of the ball. Waiting for you to like, share and follow us please. The third law of motion states that when one object exerts a force on the other object, the other object instantaneously exerts a force back on the first. These two forces are always equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. These forces act on different objects and never on the same object. In the game of football, sometimes we, while looking at the football and trying to kick it with a greater force, collide with a player of the opposite team. Both feel hurt because each applies a force on the other. In other words, there is a pair of forces and not just one force. The two opposing forces are known as action and reaction forces. Consider two spring balances connected together. The fixed end of balance B is attached with a rigid support like a wall. When a force is applied through the free end of spring balance A, it is observed that both the spring balances show the same readings on their scales. It means that the force exerted by spring balance A on balance B is equal to but opposite in direction to the force exerted by the balance B on balance A. Any of these two forces can be called as action and the other one as reaction. This gives us an alternative statement of the third law of motion. That is, to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. However, it must be remembered that action and reaction always act on two different objects and that too simultaneously. Suppose. You are standing at rest and intend to start walking on the road. You must accelerate and this requires force in accordance with the second law of motion. Which is this force? Is it the muscular effort you exert on the road? Is it the direction we intend to move? No. You push the road below backwards. The road exerts an equal and opposite force on your feet to make you move forward. It is important to note that even though the action and reaction forces are always equal in magnitude, these forces may not produce accelerations of equal magnitudes. This is because each force acts on a different object that may have a different mass. When a gun is fired, it exerts a forward force on the bullet. The bullet exerts an equal and opposite force on the gun. This results in the recoil of the gun. Since the gun has a much greater mass than the bullet, the acceleration of the gun is much less than the acceleration of the bullet. The third law of motion can also be illustrated when a sailor jumps out of a rowing boat. As the sailor jumps forward, the force on the boat makes it move backward. Suppose two balls A and B of masses MA and MB are traveling in the same direction along a straight line at different velocities UA and UB respectively. And there are no other external unbalanced forces acting on them. Let UA be greater than UB and the two balls collide with each other as shown here. During collision, which lasts for a time t, the ball A exerts a force F A B on ball B and the ball B exerts a force F B A on ball A. Suppose V A and V B are the velocities of the two balls A and B after the collision respectively. The momenta of ball A before and after the collision are M A U A and M A V A respectively. The rate of change of its momentum or FAB during the collision will be MA times VA minus UA by T. Similarly, the rate of change of momentum of ball B which is FBA during the collision will be 
एम बी टाइम्स वी बी माइनस यू बी बाई टी अकॉर्डिंग टू दर्ड लॉ ऑफ मोशन द फोर्स एफ ए बी एक्सर्टेड बाई बॉल ए ऑन दी बॉल बी एंड द फोर्स एफ बी ए एक्सर्टेड बाई दी बॉल बी ऑन बॉल ए मस्ट बी इक्वल एंड ऑपोजिट टू ईच अदर therefore fab is equal to minus fba or we can say that ma times va minus ua by t is equal to minus mb times vb minus ub by t this gives ma ua plus mu mb ub is equal to ma va plus mb vb right Since ma u a plus m b u b is the total momentum of the two balls a and b before the collision, and ma v a plus m b v b is the total momentum after the collision, we observe that the total momentum of the two balls remains unchanged or conserved, provided no external force acts. As a result of this ideal collision experiment. we say that the sum of momenta of two objects before collision is equal to the sum of momenta after the collision provided there is no external unbalanced force acting on them this is known as the law of conservation of momentum Take a big rubber balloon and inflate it fully. Tie its neck using a thread. Also using adhesive tape, fix a straw on the surface of this balloon. Pass a thread through the straw and hold one end of the thread in your hand or fix it on the wall. Now remove the thread tied to the neck of the balloon. Let the air escape from the mouth of the balloon. You would know that the straw moves in the direction opposite to the direction in which the air from the balloon leaves. Take a test tube of good quality glass material and put a small amount of water in it. Place a stop cock at the mouth of it. Now suspend the test tube horizontally by two strings or wires as shown here. Heat the test tube with a burner until water vaporizes and the cork blows out. Observe that the test tube recoils in the direction opposite to the direction of the cork. Also observe the difference in the velocity the cork appears to have and that of the recoiling test tube. If you're liking the video don't forget to hit the like button subscribe to the channel and press the notification bell A bullet of mass 20 g is horizontally fired with a velocity 150 meters per second from a pistol of mass 2 kg What is the recoil velocity of the pistol We have the mass of bullet M1 equal to 20 grams which is 0.02 kilograms and the mass of the pistol is M2 which is 2 kilograms Initial velocities of the bullet U1 and pistol U2 are 0 The final velocity of the bullet V1 is 150 meters per second The direction of bullet is taken from left to right positive by convention let v be the recoil velocity of the pistol the total momentum of the pistol and bullet before the fire when the gun is at rest is 2 plus 0.02 kg into 0 meters per second which gives us 0 kg meter per second total momentum of the pistol and the bullet after it is fired is 0.02 kg into 150 meters per second plus 2 into v which gives us 3 plus 2 v kilogram meters per second according to the law of conservation of momentum total momentum after the fire is equal to the total momentum 
before the fire. Therefore, 3 plus 2V is 0, which gives us V as 1.5 meters per second. Negative sign indicates that the direction in which the pistol would recoil is opposite to that of bullet, that is, right to left. A girl of mass 40 kg jumps with a horizontal velocity of 5 meters per second onto a stationary cart with frictionless wheels. The mass of the cart is 3 kilograms. What is the velocity as the cart starts moving? Assume that there is no external unbalanced force working in the horizontal direction. Let V be the velocity of the girl on the cart as the cart starts moving. The total momentum of the girl and cart before the interaction is 40 into 5 plus 3 into 0, which gives us 200 kilogram meter per second. Total momentum after the interaction, 40 plus 3 kilogram into V, which gives us 43 V. According to the law of conservation of momentum, the total momentum is conserved during the interaction. That is, 43V is 200 now, which gives us V to be 4.65 meters per second. The girl on the cart would move with a velocity of 4.65 meters per second in the direction in which the girl jumped. Two hockey players of opposite teams while trying to hit a hockey ball on the ground, collide and immediately become entangled. One has a mass of 60 kg and was moving with a velocity 5 m per second, while the other has a mass of 55 kg and was moving faster with a velocity 6 m per second towards the first player. In which direction and with what velocity will they move after they become entangled. Assume that the frictional force acting between the feet of the two players and ground is negligible. Let the first player be moving from left to right. By convention, left to right is taken as the positive direction and thus right to left is the negative direction. If symbols M and U represent the mass and initial velocity of the two players respectively, M1 is 60 kg, U1 is 5 meters per second and M2 is 55 kg and U2 is minus 6 meters per second. The total momentum of the two players before the collision would be 60 times 5 plus 55 times minus 6 which gives us minus 30 kg meters per second. If V is the velocity of the two entangled players after the collision, the total momentum then would be m1 plus m2 times v which gives us 60 plus 55 kilogram into v that is 115 v equating the momentum of the system before and after the collision in accordance with the law of conservation of momentum we get v equal to minus 30 by 115 which gives us 0.26 meters per second thus the two entangled players would move with velocity 0.26 meters per second from right to left, that is in the direction the second player was moving before the collision. If action is always equal to the reaction, explain how a horse can pull a cart. According to Newton's third law of motion, action force is equal to reaction but acts on two different bodies and in opposite directions. When a horse pushes the ground, the ground reacts and exerts a force on the horse in the forward direction. This force is able to overcome friction force of the cart and it moves. Explain why is it difficult for a fireman to hold a hose which ejects large amounts of water at a high velocity. 
Newton's third law of motion states that every action has an equal and opposite reaction. Hose pipes eject a large amount of water at a high velocity. There is a backward reaction force due to the water rushing out. This tends to decrease the stability of the fireman, thus making it difficult for him to hold it. From a rifle of mass 4 kg, a bullet of mass 50 g is fired with an initial velocity of 35 m per second. Calculate the initial recoil velocity of the rifle. We are given that mass of the rifle is 4 kg, mass of the bullet is 50 g which is 0 0.05 kg. Recoil velocity of the rifle is V1. A bullet is fired with an initial velocity V2 equal to 35 meters per second. Initially, the rifle is at rest, thus its initial velocity is zero. The initial, total initial momentum of the rifle and bullet system would be M1 plus M2 times U, which is zero. The total momentum of the rifle and bullet system after firing would be M1 V1 plus M2 V2, which gives us 4 V1 plus 1.75. According to the conservation law, total momentum after the firing is equal to the total momentum before the firing, which gives us 4V1 plus 1.75 equal to 0 and thus V1 equal to 0.4375 meters per second. The negative sign indicates that the rifle recoils backwards with a velocity of 0.4375 meters per second. Two objects of masses 100 gram and 200 gram are moving along the same line and direction with velocities of 2 meters per second and 1 meters per second respectively. They collide and after the collision, the first object moves at a velocity of 1.67 meters per second. Determine the velocity of the second object. We are given that the mass of one of the objects M1 is 100 gram which is 0.1 kilogram, mass of the other object is 0.2 kilogram, velocity of M1 before collision is 2, velocity of M2 before collision is 1 and velocity of M1 after collision is 1.67 meters per second. We have to find out the velocity of M2 after the collision. Let's assume it is V4 meters per second. According to the law of conservation of momentum, total momentum before the collision is equal to the total momentum after collision. Therefore, M1V1 plus M2V2 is equal to M1V3 plus M2V4. On substituting the known and given values, we get 2 times 0.1 plus 1 times 0.2 is equal to 1.67 times 0.1 plus V4 times 0.2. Thus, V4 is 1.165 meters per second. Hence, the velocity of the second object becomes 1.165 meters per second after the collision. Conservation Laws All conservation laws such as conservation of momentum, energy, angular momentum, charge, etc. are considered to be the fundamental laws in physics. These are based on observations and experiments. It is important to remember that a conservation law cannot be proved. It can be verified or disproved by experiments. An experiment whose result is in conformity with the law verifies or substantiates the law. It does not prove the law. On the other hand, a single experiment whose result goes against the law is enough to disprove it. The law of conservation of momentum has been deduced from a large number of observations and experiments. This law was formulated nearly three centuries ago. It is interesting to note that not a single situation has been realized so far that contradicts this law. Several experiences of everyday life can be explained on the basis of the law of conservation of momentum. 
that's it guys hope you could make it hope we could make it easier for you in that case do give us a thumbs up do let us know your feedback in the comment section below also what else would you want us to add here or anything that you could not understand it would help us improve thank you so much appreciate your patience have a great day bye bye